It has been a very exciting year for TV 2015, these first six months about to wrap. And right now we have two people who know the pulse of what's going on. And give me, give us some thoughts about what we can expect the second six months. There are two people I've known for quite a long while. One of them is somebody I actually write for with Kamabi Televised Columns, what used to be Media Viz Bloggers, and now MediaVillage.com. It's a pleasure to have with us the noted media analyst who has not been on this program, believe it or not, since 2008, Jack Myers. Hello, Jack. How are you, Simon? I can't believe I haven't been on this program. Yeah, we'll talk about what we talked about, virtual worlds, back in 2008. And joining both That's as well right. as someone who is a familiar, familiar favorite in terms of New York and newspapers, he is the former New York Times advertising columnist. He knows that uh, subject backwards and forwards, and now he is writing for Jack and Media Village. It's a pleasure to welcome to this program, for the very first time, Stuart Elliott. Hello, Stuart. Hello there. Great to have both of you on. Jack, what do you see as the first big trend of uh, TV 2015? What's the big story for you? The big story is the continued slowdown of network television. The, the last year we saw in the, in the network television upfront marketplace, uh, a very slow marketplace. Volume was down uh, for the broadcast networks about 8%, for the cable networks 4 to 6%. Uh, my projection was that it would be down again this year, and it is. The volume is down. Uh, the CPMs, the costs per thousand, are up. Uh, if they're up, they're only up a few percentage points. Uh, so the real uh, story is the continued slowdown of advertisers moving money into network television, both broadcast and cable. And, of course, the big question is where is it going? The second big story that, frankly, Stewart can speak to better than I can is the more than $30 billion that advertisers have put up for review with their media agencies and the impact that could have on the industry over the next several years. Stewart, you want to speak to that and how it's impacting television programming, what we watch? Uh, yeah, the, uh, for all that is being said about the, uh, so, the so-called uh, death of television, quote-unquote, it still remains the largest and most uh, powerful advertising medium. It is, uh, for many advertisers, still a go-to decision. There are still uh, many, many, many major advertisers that spend uh, the bulk or a majority of their uh, advertising dollars on TV, uh, the big issue, of course, is uh, what that means in terms of what TV will be or what TV is becoming. I think uh, in a lot of ways you're going to see uh, advertisers and agencies redefining TV uh, to be video, and that will cover not only broadcasting cable but also streaming and uh, all sorts of other things, web series, and uh, the kinds of, uh, of uh, viewing that's being done increasingly now, particularly by younger people, on uh, devices like tablets and smartphones. Uh, in many cases, in most cases, I'd say, uh, the content that these folks are watching is still uh, what uh, is coming from uh, traditional television. But the issue is how is this going to be bought uh, whether uh, this is all going to be seen as a video market instead of a, uh, a television slash online market, and uh, how uh, some of these old ways of doing things, how fast they're going to change. And as Jack pointed out, uh, a parallel story right now, which is very uh, having a big impact on this, are all these uh, decisions by these big marketers to put their uh, media accounts into review, and uh, the timing of this is intriguing because it's coming as the upfront season is underway in terms of these agencies having to negotiate uh, on behalf of their clients with the, uh, with the media in order to uh, buy commercial time. So uh, in some cases, you're having uh, negotiations uh, underway with people who uh, at the end of the process, may not be uh, across the table to sign the uh, the contract uh, that they uh, that they've negotiated because they might uh, lose their uh, the the account in a uh, in one of these reviews. So uh, there are a lot of cross currents right now, and it's uh, fascinating as a, as a observer to uh, to watch all of this. But I imagine if you're in the middle of the the TV business or the media business, it's uh, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a very ang anxious period. 
Jeff? And there are three three real issues, Simon, if I can, uh, driving the the, uh, uh, the cross currents. Uh, the first is uh, data, data, and more data. This is the first time that uh, both the broadcast and the cable networks in this year's upfront have brought not just their Nielsen ratings to the table, uh, but an extensive array of performance-based data coming from companies like Nielsen and their Catalina division, but also coming from Oracle, from Adobe, uh, from MarketShare, and a number of other providers, uh, unified uh, Almost every leading network company has announced some type of currency that tries to tie television advertising uh, back into actual uh, consumer sales and show that the two are connected and therefore the television has a greater value. The uh, complicated factor to that is that the marketers, the uh, increase in the influence of the procurement officers, the supply chain management, the people who are responsible for bringing pricing down. And most people believe that uh, the agency reviews that are up are, are in many ways being driven by procurement and the need to generate lower cost from their media suppliers. So at the same time, you have the networks bringing new research in, showing greater value, while at the same time, you see the uh, the agencies and the clients saying, well, yeah, that's all great, but we want it for less money. And then, of course, the third factor, which is tied in, as Stuart pointed out, is the growth of alternative video viewing options, uh, many of which are uh, tied into the network's own content, uh, but nonetheless offer, in many instances, a more efficient venue for advertisers, and therefore we're seeing dollars flowing Flowing may be too aggressive a word, as Stuart also pointed out, but moving, shifting uh, to a certain extent from television into various types of digital video. What's interesting, though, Jack and Stuart, is that it seems that the advertisers are pulling back. And if you're a person who watches television, you might be saying, isn't that crazy? Because the sense I get is more people are watching television. You look at particularly uh, shows aimed at or involving people of color like Empire, like Blackish, like Fresh Off the Boat, like CBS's, uh, most of CBS's new shows this season uh, made it, whether it was Madam Secretary or Scorpion. You have more shows on cable making it, more cable networks out there. Spanish language television seems to be booming. And then, of course, you do have the smart TV set and the devices that make TV sets smart, like Roku and Chromecast and so forth. I want to get to that in a second. But what do you say to people who think, hey, with all this interest in programming and we're supposed to be in this big new era of original scripted television where things are really booming and there's more opportunity for all, why are the advertisers pulling back? Isn't that sort of crazy when you compare it to the programming marketplace for what we're watching? Well, I think uh, it's, again, that some of it is, a, is an issue of, uh, of labeling and some of it is, a, is an issue of the fact that at the moment things are in such flux that... Uh, it's sort of hard to, uh, to uh, pinpoint uh, what to call certain things. I think, obviously, if you take an example like Empire, which was so tremendously successful yeah. on Fox and came out of the blue, you had people that were watching it live in real time. Then you had many other millions of people watching it on a, a delay through a DVR. You had other people watching it on VOD. You had people watching it online on their, on their smartphones, on their tablets. Uh, if you aggregate all of that viewing, it's a tremendous number. It's a, it's a, it's a fantastic number. But uh, in the case of other TV shows, uh, you look at the, uh, the viewership that's on the actual traditional TV live in real time, which is what the advertisers like, because there's much more of a chance that the viewers are going to see the commercials. And in many cases, the viewing in that way is falling. But, you know, on the aggregate, maybe it's uh, the same or maybe even more because these new ways of watching uh, video like VOD and DVR and uh, streaming, that opens the opportunity for viewership among people who wouldn't or couldn't have the opportunity to see the show originally. Uh, there are some shows that if you add in uh, this new kind of viewership to their uh, uh, the first time that they're being broadcast or cable cast, the, the audience doubles, or in some cases even is, is increasing more than 100%. But uh, if you look at it from the bucket of, oh, yes, it's, it's when it's on television, quote-unquote, 
uh, the, the ad sales are down or the, the Nielsen numbers are down, then you could look at it and say, oh, it's, it, the glass is, is half empty. But if you, if you aggregate it uh, through the, uh, the food chain, this new food chain uh, that's being uh, built, uh, you can look at it and say the glass is half full or maybe even more than half full. And in that context, uh, Simon, except for sports and event programming, uh, since the 1960s, advertisers have not bought programs. They've bought impressions, and it's almost been, uh, other than the audiences that the programs reach, the demographics, uh, you know, pro the, the advertisers have looked at it that programs come and go, they get canceled, so they're buying audiences and the networks guarantee the number of impressions on a cost per thousand impressions basis. So the golden age of, of television content that I think we're not only in, but have been in for a while and will continue to be in. Uh, while it impacts on advertisers, it's certainly not a driving influence. Now, this move toward more data that might move us back into a sponsorship type model where the, the content and the programming will be more relevant and uh, advertisers uh, will stay with a particular program across all the platforms that Stewart is. Uh, uh, pointing to, uh, but that's, that will be the minority of advertisers and the minority of advertiser budgets. That's Jack Myers. He is the proprietor and main analyst of Media Village, formerly Media Viz Bloggers, which, by the way, I happen to write for, so I want to get that disclaimer in. And we also have Stuart Elliott, the former New York Times advertising columnist who just joined Media Village. You can catch his columns there a few weeks ago. They're both with me here in New York this half hour on Tomorrow Be Televised. Jack we also have a smart TV, a smart TV making device marketplace going. It's very clear to me, putting the two cents in, that people are embracing these devices, whether it is watching television on a Samsung or an LG smart set that allows you to watch the internet, play video games without a console, interact, do e-commerce on the set. You also now have Google Chromecast. Roku has 10 million people watching it through a certain device, streaming stick, set-top box set. We now maybe have a possibly have an Apple TV set top down the road. There's NVIDIA Shield and so forth. What do you think about this whole phenomenon of smart TVs and smart devices? How much impact are they having on what we watch and how we use television? Advertisers and audiences have been waiting a long time for uh, the promise of interactive television. Uh, it's been since the late 1990s that in interactive TV was a hot button for the industry. Addressable advertising is something advertisers have been looking for for years, and, and now in many ways they have it with, uh, with digital advertising across, online, uh, the ability to target specific people based on their patterns. We're seeing more and more set-top box data becoming available, uh, and that's being used to help drive uh, dis uh, advertiser decisions, and we're seeing the ability through many databases to connect up the audience with their actual purchase behavior, not just their looking at their viewing behavior alone, but also looking at how their viewing of advertising and programming drives their, influ drives their impact, what, program, what other programs are likely to watch for promotional. So it's not, in my opinion, yet really impacting on what we're seeing on television, but it's impacting to a huge extent on what we're seeing online and on mobile, because that's where uh, the programming decisions are being more directly driven uh, by the connection to the specific audiences they're reaching. More and more, it appears to me that network television programmers are looking, and, and ad salespeople are looking to replicate the digital model in television. I'm not quite sure why uh, they're not looking at the distinct and unique values that television delivers in the way of loyalty and devotion to certain programs, destination models. Television seems like such a more powerful uh, programming uh, opportunity. Uh, but yes, if you look at it, that the smart TV, all those capabilities is driving better data, Data is ultimately driving programming decisions. It's going to have, in my opinion, an enormous value, but I think we're still two, three, four years away from that being significant. 
Stuart, we just came through a season known as the upfront season in the business, but you could also call it the fall summer programming preview of the television networks. And in many ways, it was a very weird season. Networks that used to do upfront events didn't do them, like AMC. Others decided to downsize their event, make them press events. And a lot of people um, who were in or out were like sort of wishy-washy about it. If you don't do these events, at least for the press, so that the public has an idea of what's coming up, do you run the risk now of falling off a viewer's radar screen? If you don't know what AMC is doing, if you don't know what uh, TV Land is doing, if you don't know what Univision is doing, that uh, it now becomes a detriment to the network. Well, I think the big issue right now is it's sort of uh, the, the, the second golden age of television, as so many people are calling it now. There are the, the good news is there's this incredible, amazing smorgasbord of, uh, of, of shows and options that uh, in terms of choice to the viewer, uh, it, it's never been more. There's never been more. I think somebody said the other day there's three, over 300 different uh, television series on right now between broadcast and cable, and I don't even think that counts the, uh, uh, the streaming series and the web series. Uh, that, uh, all that choice, though, is also uh, uh, a detriment to it at the same time in that uh, it is increasingly difficult for the uh, devotee of, of TV, much less uh, the average viewer who's just looking to, uh, for something to watch for an hour or two, to keep track of all of this. And uh, certainly whatever the networks and programmers and program creators can do to help uh, navigate through that, I think would be welcome, whether it's uh, more upfront presentations or some sort of... Uh, of uh, press coverage or something on online or on uh, on the screen. I mean, you had you said the TV Guide channel. Uh, I think in most cases, it's it's, it's there's not a guide there anymore. So uh, it's uh, it's a wonderful opportunity now in terms of watching so many different kinds of programs, scripted, unscripted, uh, dramas and comedies and shows with uh, with uh, points of view and adult content and more mature. Uh, approaches to uh, uh, to uh, to the audience and and all of that, but uh, uh, as somebody myself, I'll just say who is a big fan of TV and tries to keep up with uh, all the uh, uh, new shows that are coming on that that seem interesting and different. Uh, certainly, the the Deutschland eighty three that you've been talking about that one uh, got on my radar a week or two ago, and I uh, jotted down the fact that it's premiering on. Uh, Sundance TV this Wednesday, uh, but there's so many other things that you find out uh, afterwards. And then the other issue, I think, is to the idea now that if you decide to start to watch a TV series, it's an entirely different commitment than it used to be in the old days when so many shows had uh, self-contained episodes that you could watch and uh, you could miss a couple and you wouldn't miss any ongoing developments or changes in the cast of the show or their relationship. Now, even uh, 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 even the most uh, uh, traditional of, of sitcoms or, or drama shows will have, if they're not uh, if they're not serialized, they'll have some serialized elements within uh, the program. Where if you watch it in uh, September and you don't come back till uh, uh, November or January, you're going to be missing out on. Uh, uh, some fundamental changes in the uh, in the cast or in the uh, the the relationships among them. So uh, that uh, counts. It, it requires the the, the viewer to uh, to spend a lot more time keeping track of things and uh, and keeping tabs of all of these uh, uh, evolving plot lines. And if you watch shows like uh, The Americans and uh, Empire and uh, and uh, Justified, which I was a big fan of, that just ended. Uh, a show called uh, Graceland that's coming back on USA. Uh, it's a commitment because uh, every week there's uh, enough significant developments uh, uh, in the uh, in the relationships among the cast members, the characters. That if you miss two or three episodes, uh, you you come back you come back to it. You're you're out of luck. Jack Netflix. 
It wants to be now the world's biggest original programmer. It seems that every uh, new show that's come uh, to light on this sheet this first six months has turned to gold. Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, Between, Bloodline, Daredevil, and so forth. Uh, how big is Netflix ambitions? How big do you think it will get starting with the second half of this year? Netflix ambitions are huge and always have been. Uh, it's going to continue to grow. They're going to continue to make significant investments in original content. They have a completely different economic model, as does Amazon. And, and Amazon, to me, uh, not quite a sleeper. They're, they're, we're, they're wide awake, but they're also a major uh, force in Hollywood today and in the programming community internationally. Uh, uh, writers, uh, showrunners, uh, producers are going to them uh, first in many instances to Netflix because of the great amount of creative freedom, because they're like HBO, able to run programming uh, now on demand and without commercial interruption. So there's a completely different uh, model for developing the content. Uh, they, they like the idea that they can develop for a full season and uh, viewers can watch them uh, the full season on demand. We're going to see more and more of that, I believe. They're a huge influence and will just become uh, more and more important uh, with others following. Uh, Voodoo, Roku, uh, Apple, Amazon, um, more and more development of original programming. I want to add BitTorrent also, which uh, is also going to try to get into the game before this, uh, this year is out. Stuart, uh, I think one of the big stories this first six months is diversity on television. It definitely is happening, thanks to Empire, thanks to Shonda Rhimes and becoming the first person of color, woman of color, to program an entire night of television on any network, broadcast, or cable. Uh, and as another at least one more show coming up uh, starting this fall. You've got shows like Fresh Off the Boat, American Crime from John Ridley. You have more networks aimed at people of color, what BET, TV One, Up, et cetera, doing. Uh, Spanish language networks continue to grow. Univision, Telemundo, they are now getting into some interesting new probing directions, some of which be produced here in the U.S. Um, and yet with advertising, there still is this issue of for every advertiser who is involved with Spanish language television, there are still far too many that are not. Although we're starting to see companies like Affleck get into the TV advertising game and so forth. What do you think, Stuart, about diversity? Are we now at the point where we're, we're saying, okay, diversity must be a part of television and so should advertising? Well, I think it's been uh, shockingly uh, lagging on the parts of both the advertisers and the big media companies to address uh, the issue of the uh, changing nature of the uh, American public. Uh, you would think with the marketplace changing the way it is, with the rise of, uh, of uh, non-traditional households and uh, more ethnic diversity and so forth, you would think that just from a dollars and cents uh, survival point of view, that these would have been addressed uh, previously, but uh, for whatever reasons, uh, there has been a lag. I think it's starting to uh, change. One reason is that uh, uh, certainly uh, the statistics, the data, uh, is, shows that uh, uh, minority households do tend to watch more traditional television than, uh, than others, and uh, the fact that uh, these folks are actually there and have more of a penchant uh, to watch uh, programming when it's live and being broadcast or cablecast uh, in the moment. Uh, that, that uh, I think, is, is starting to uh, influence uh, people. Uh, I thought it was very interesting. I, I watched Empire every, uh, every week on Fox uh, in real time from the beginning, and it was interesting to me that it was not until, like, the third or fourth episode that I began to see uh, commercials with uh, predominantly uh, African-American casts uh, to them or, or African-American narrators uh, or a, a diversity uh, uh, sort of uh, casting to the commercials. And uh, it, took, it, took, it took, certainly you could say that Empire's hit, how successful it was, took people by surprise. But it was funny to see the, uh, the advertisers scrambling to... Uh, to do that, and uh, you talk about uh, uh, addressability. I mean, that's a very primitive version of it. Uh, running uh, commercials inside of a uh, broadcast television program that uh, reflect uh, reflect and address the uh, content of the uh, show that they're uh, interrupting. Uh, yet uh, it took uh, it took the advertisers a while to uh, to get hip to that and to and to start to do that. 
We have and, a call. And also, to add to that, if I can, Simon, the fact that uh, Hispanic audiences especially uh, tend to be much more loyal to advertisers who are supporting uh, Hispanic language uh, television and Hispanic focused programs uh, on Telemundo and other networks. So uh, there, there is a, there are a lot of reasons, uh, demographic, psychographic, loyalty, purchase patterns, uh, that where advertisers should be paying much more attention to uh, diversifying their ad schedule uh, than they are now. Rick Webb is on the line from Philadelphia. Hi, Rick. How you doing? Hi, Simon. I'm doing well. All right. You've got uh, Jack Myers and Stuart Elliott at your call. Go ahead. Hey, guys. Uh, I have a question. Have, do you know of any shows that have been canceled, not because of ratings, but because the advertisers weren't able to sell, uh, I guess, the products weren't successful with a certain TV show? Like, like I mean, I'll just make up, like, we'll say Cadillac or advertising on a particular show or maybe um, the main sponsor for a show, and they just weren't selling any more cars. So they stop sponsoring the show, and then it gets canceled. Like, does stuff like that happen at all nowadays? The, uh, the days when the soul, when the show had one sponsor or two sponsors are long in the past, and uh, right now the, the typical TV show is sliced and diced with dozens of uh, advertisers uh, buying the commercial time during each episode. So the cause and effect relationship there, I think, is really hard uh, to, uh, to uh, point to. I think, generally speaking, if a show gets low ratings, which means that not a lot of people are watching it, yeah. it's in, in much Stuart, more... Stuart, can you recall any show that was canceled because of controversial content, even though it had rating success? Oh, well, you have to go back a very long way to the, the big example that, that everyone always cites is a uh, situation comedy that was on CBS many years ago called Bridget Loves Bernie. It was about a uh, mixed yep. marriage between an Irish Catholic woman and a Jewish guy, and it was like the number two or three rated show on CBS or on any TV, on any network that season, because I think it ran adjacent to MASH or Mary Tyler Moore or some of the other... Uh, successful uh, CBS comedies, but the uh, the uh, content involving the mixed marriage of the uh, characters was uh, very controversial. Uh, there were a lot of uh, of uh, complaints about it, uh, and uh, the show was canceled after one season. So uh, that's the uh, example that everybody points to, uh, uh, and that was unusual because that was during the period where CBS was putting a lot of these shows on the air where you began to have uh, uh, controversial and contentious content like uh, the Jeffersons and All in the Family and, uh, and uh, Maud and some of these shows that uh, uh, finally began to address uh, society in the way it was. So uh, that was a notable example that uh, the, uh, the uh, complaints about uh, Bridget Loves Bernie wound up uh, CBS scuttled the show. Interesting, interesting, because at least... I think that it's going to get back to having main sponsors, even if there are multiple, multiple sponsors. I think there are going to be main sponsors, like Sons of Anarchy seem to have, um, you know, Harley Davidson as a main sponsor and selling, they were even selling products and, and bikes named after that. Right. So, well, that's going to be, so, that's, a, that's a bit, that's been, a, that's been a, a, a rapidly growing trend in the last few years. It goes by different names, like, sponsored content, branded content, branded entertainment. The idea is to uh, present a more um, integrated uh, version of the advertising pitch, whereas it's not just commercials interrupting your favorite show, but maybe the product is on uh, in the actual show. It's integrated into the plot. Or maybe uh, the, uh, the sponsor... Uh, will uh, cut back their commercial load for the episode, and that's announced at the beginning of the show that uh, so-and-so company is bringing you this show with limited commercial interruptions. That's something that uh, FX is, uh, is, does a lot of at the, uh, for the first and final episodes in a season of a popular series. They will uh, arrange for a sponsor to do that and, uh, and uh, have a... Uh, 
have a, an announcement at the beginning and the end that uh, to thank that uh, that munificent sponsor for cutting back their uh, their uh, commercial uh, load. But I think you know the 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 the, the practice by which in the early days of television individual sponsors were responsible for each show uh it benefited a lot of people it benefited the the sponsors and the agencies because they owned the shows it benefited the viewer because there were a lot fewer commercials and they were only came from one or two companies during the entire uh program so you didn't have the uh issue of clutter and uh confusion and uh and breaks so many breaks uh, but that was all uh, uh, for a number of reasons that uh, that faded away in the 60s and 70s, and now you're uh, uh, now you see the system that we have that we've had for many years, and a lot of people are experimenting and trying to figure out a way uh, to go back to the future and uh, bring back the days of, uh, of regularly sponsored programs. Definitely interesting. I'm definitely going to be following it. So thank you very much for your insight. And Simon, am I am I allowed to guess on the trivia question? Uh, not on the air. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but off air for sure. Okay? okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Simon. You got it. Thanks, Rick. Take care. Rick Webb, our good friend from Philadelphia, he'll guess off the air. All right, thirty seconds each, gentlemen. Uh, next six months of 2015. What one thing are you looking for, Jack? Start with you. You got thirty seconds. Next six months, I'm looking to see how the, uh, the television upfront market unfolds because it is still very slowly moving and uh, whether there is a strong fourth quarter scatter which will dictate the performance of the whole media marketplace for 2016. Stuart? I'm looking to see the outcome of all of these many, many, many uh, reviews of media accounts that are going on, whether there will be even more than there are now and the ones that are, uh, that are uh, pending currently, how those are going to turn out and whether uh, there are going to be enough uh, agencies to go around to uh, compete for some of these big assignments. And for me, Jack and Stewart, I'm looking forward to NBC's new move into live programming this fall. Uh, best year with Neil Patrick Harris, Tuesday Night Variety Hour from New York. Uh, Undateable, the uh, comedy becoming a live comedy for the first time in uh, more than a decade. And also other things they may be doing, like, for example, maybe a live courtroom show from Dick Wolf. I'm also looking forward to the transgender proming movement. Uh, thanks to things like Becoming Us, which just premiered on ABC Family, and the Discovery Life Channel series, and the upcoming uh, program uh, about uh, Jenner. On E, whether we're going to see more of that, both scripted and unscripted. And also one more thing. Will Apple TV finally come up with a set-top box, which will make a TV smart? If they do, how fast will those thousands, hundreds of thousands of Apple developers for smartphone and tablets, the iPhone, the iPod, come together and maybe do stuff for television? Uh, so that's what I'm thinking. You can read Jack Myers and Stuart Elliott's commentary, plus much more at this web address, www.mediavillage.com. It's www.mediavillage.com. And that's where you'll also find my Tomorrow Will Be Televised columns. Jack Myers, Stuart Elliott, thank you very much for a wonderful discussion. Great to have you on. Let's do this uh, before 2015 ends, shall we? Yeah, uh, let's thank you. do it often. Thank you, Simon. Good job. Thank you so much, Jack. Thanks, Stuart. All the best. Take care. Bye. Jack Myers, Stuart Elliott, joining me live in New York.